for some here, I guess, the big takeaway from this morning, the thing to pray about, the thing to talk about with your spouse is simply this, how should I serve? Where do I begin? What has God saved me to do? Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And uh, Jonathan, that is a big question for the person who maybe is not serving right now and they are a believer, they do know Christ, uh, and they're struggling to know what would God have me do? What has he saved me to do? Uh, how would you answer that question? Well, there's not a one-size-fits-all answer in terms of the practicalities of what God has called us to do and what is our particular role within the church and the world. That's going to be a little bit different for each one of us. But the Bible insists, and Paul really wants to highlight here the fact that God has prepared good works beforehand for each one of us to do. He has a special role for each one of us who know Christ to play within the church. And that is a thrilling thing to consider, to figure out exactly what that's going to be. Well, it's going to take prayer, the wisdom of others, and a good deal of discernment. But what an encouraging thought for each of us. Yeah, it really is. And for the person who is thinking about getting involved, maybe they've kind of got this idea of where God may uh, be directing them to serve. Would you just say, jump in and try, just just go do it? Well, I, I think it's so helpful to be part of a church family within a structure of leadership as well within a church, some God-appointed leaders who are going to have some wisdom and insight. And I think it's just great to come to your local church leadership and say, I've got this on my heart. I think maybe the, the Lord has gifted me for this. What do you think? W would it be appropriate for me to serve in this way? And time and time again, I find your whatever the structure is of your church, but your elders or your pastors, your leadership, will have some wisdom to speak into that that could be incredibly helpful. Yeah. Well, we're going to uh, continue to look at this topic as we open up God's Word together. We're in Ephesians chapter 2 as we continue a message called Brought from Death to Life. Here is Jonathan. Sometimes we'll talk about God's love when we outline the gospel. Sometimes we will think about His mercy. Sometimes we'll reflect upon His amazing grace. Those are all very big and very rich gospel words. And those features of God's disposition toward us in Christ, His love, His mercy, His grace, they're all wonderful. They're all interwoven. And they each one bear a tremendous weight of gospel meaning. But as Paul considers the theme of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, he gets carried away, doesn't he? And he just piles all these terms on top of one another. In verses 4 and 5, they're all there. Out of love, God sent His Son into the world to be our Savior. In His mercy, God refrains from punishing us as our sins so richly deserve. He refrains from pouring out His wrath upon us, but instead He takes our guilt upon Himself in the person of His Son, and He bears that punishment in our place. And in His grace, He gives us new life. He gives us a future, an eternal inheritance. In fact, Paul says, as we're joined together with Jesus, as we're one with Christ by His Spirit, there is a real sense in which you and I have already entered into that future, a future of grace, a future that we don't deserve. Verse 6 is a highly intriguing verse. We could have spent all morning on verse 6, but it speaks of the reality of being united to Christ as Paul tells us, that God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the eternal realms in Christ Jesus. That's a statement to stretch our thinking to the very limit and beyond. Even as we live here below as the church of Jesus Christ, since we are joined to the Savior, we are at the same time with Him above. Here's what God's power has achieved. Here is what God has done for us in His great love. It's a stunning portrait of God's gracious work, His saving work, His wonderful rescue. And Paul is very concerned as we come to grips with these things to show us that it really is all God's work. 
But at the same time, he does slip in a reminder of how we become beneficiaries of this salvation, how this salvation came to us if we're believers. He reminds us that there is a necessary response, and we turn to that verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast." You'll notice that in reminding of us of our necessary response to the grace of God, here in verse 8, Paul lays considerable emphasis on how it is that we are not saved. He emphasizes the negative. Salvation is not from ourselves. It is not by works so that no one can boast. When I'm talking to folks from outside Canada, perhaps when traveling to the U.S. or talking with friends in the U.K., I tell them that we live in Ottawa, and I frequently find myself reminding them that Ottawa is actually the capital of Canada. I like to just get that detail in there, not Toronto, as they so frequently think. It seems to be an almost universal assumption that Toronto is the national capital. Having grown up in Toronto, I have some sympathy with the idea, but it is a common misconception. And I find it's usually just helpful to clear away the misinformation as quickly as possible. Now, when talking about the way in which we are saved, Paul finds it necessary here and elsewhere to clear away the big misconception that it seems almost everyone holds, the idea that we are saved by good works. It's the default assumption of the human heart to think that we are saved by doing certain things, by keeping certain rules, by performing certain rites and rituals. And that's the principle, that's the belief that stands behind basically every world religion. Do certain things, behave a certain way, participate in certain rites and rituals, keep certain rules, and you will be acceptable to the divine. You will be saved. And so even though Paul has been at such pains already in Ephesians 1 and 2 to drive home the point that salvation is all God's work, even though he has said it so clearly already, he feels the need to lay it out again here. We are not saved by anything of our own doing. It is all of grace. It's all of grace. However, there is a means by which we take hold of this gracious salvation gift. There is a response that we need to make. This response doesn't achieve salvation. It doesn't contribute to salvation in any way. But it is necessary if we are to benefit from salvation, if we are to receive salvation. And that response, of course, is the response of faith. And by that, Paul means simply that we need to take God at His word. We need to believe that Jesus is who He says He is, and that He has done what He has said He has done, and that He will do what He says He will do in the future. We need to believe that His death paid for our sin, that His resurrection opens the way to life. We need to trust Him. We need to have faith. Salvation is, as Paul says, by grace through faith. Now, here again, if you're an observer and an inquirer, but not yet a believer, this is vitally important stuff for you to engage with and to process, to reckon with. It may be that you've come here this morning with the assumption that God wants you to earn your way into His good books. Maybe that's why you came to church this morning. You thought, this is part of the list, the, check, the checklist that I need to satisfy. After all, there is a price tag to everything worth having in this world. Good things come to those who work for them. We all know that. But now you need to unravel that assumption when it comes to the gospel of grace. You need to get to grips with the reality of God's gift to us in Jesus Christ. God has achieved and has fully provided salvation for us. And all that is needed, all that is needed for you this morning is to believe. And so the, the question is, is simple. It is this, will you trust Him? Will you take Him at His word? Will you put your faith in Jesus Christ even today? God's kindness to us in Jesus is almost impossibly great. His generosity is almost inconceivable. Why has He done 
what he has done? What is God's greater purpose in all this? What is his aim? Well, that's Paul's next and his final concern. He rounds out this overview of the story of our salvation by showing us something of God's grand design. I don't know how often you have an opportunity to build something from a kit with instructions, maybe some furniture, maybe a Lego set with your kids, maybe a more advanced piece of equipment of some kind. But whatever it is, if you have that experience of working with a kid and with instructions, you know how vitally important it is to have in your mind's eye as you go a picture of the completed article and an understanding of what it is to do and how it is to function, the purpose for which you're building it. You need to know what the end goal is. Here toward the end of our passage, Paul gives us vital insight into God's ultimate design for us in our salvation. Why he has done, is doing, and will do the things he does. And having this insight that Paul gives us here, it is vital to our understanding of our purpose as the people of God. It helps us to understand what the Christian life is actually all about. And really, the components of what Paul tells us here are possibly a little surprising for us. The first aspect of the answer comes for us in verse 7. God has raised us to life and seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. And here comes the purpose statement. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That's God's purpose. That's his grand design. It's always wonderful to meet a believer who has come to Christ out of an unlikely story and unlikely circumstances, someone who's come maybe from a violent past, a criminal past, from a history of real brokenness of some kind, perhaps a convert from another religion who was aggressively opposed to the gospel. And if someone comes to Christ from a position of antagonism and has a story of dramatic life transformation, we will sometimes speak of that person as being a true trophy of grace. I wonder if you've heard that expression. It's a lovely expression. A wonderful picture of God's kindness, His victory in Christ, His great salvation. It's wonderful to hear stories of that kind. But Paul wants us to understand here that each one of us, whatever our story, however undramatic it may seem, each one of us is a trophy of God's grace, a tribute to what God has achieved. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called Brought from Death to Life. We're taking a look at the first 10 verses of Ephesians chapter 2 today. And if you miss any part of a broadcast, you can always come and you can listen online. Our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org, and you can stream the program or download an MP3 for free when you're there. You can also listen on the go if you have the Encounter the Truth app. That's also free, and you'll find it at your favorite app store. Just go there and search for Encounter the Truth, and that's a great way to listen to Jonathan's teaching whenever it fits your schedule. Again, it's the Encounter the Truth app, free at your favorite app store. Well, let's get back to the message. Again, if you joined us a little late, we're in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Once again, here is Jonathan. All of us had the story of verses 1 and 2 and 3. But now, if we belong to Him, God has placed us in Christ in the most prominent position in all the universe. He has seated us on high, so that in all the rolling ages to come, the population of the heavenlies, I guess angels and saints together, will look on you and will look on me and will look on all the redeemed and say, what a God we have, what a Savior. What a redeemer, what a king. Each one of us will be for all eternity a means of displaying the incomparable riches of God's grace and his kindness in Christ. And that will be our role for all the ages to come. We're going to be God's trophies of grace displayed on high to draw praise and glory to Him for all the ages to come. What a thought. What an image. 
We've been seeing throughout Ephesians how God-centered our salvation really is. It's something that God achieves for His own glory. And you and I are saved, Paul is telling us, that God might be glorified in all eternity, that His grace might be displayed. That's a key insight into God's purpose and His plan in salvation. But Paul gives us a further insight and a related one, I think, in verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I had my first ride in a pickup truck for many years just recently. I don't think I'd been in a Ford F-150 for a good long time, but I happened to be heading somewhere with a friend who has one of these, a pretty new one, and I I couldn't believe the experience, I have to tell you. In my youth, an F-150 meant a a pretty basic workhorse, no bells, no whistles there, a pretty rough ride, pretty basic interior, nothing luxurious at all. So with that in mind, I was pleasantly surprised to find that I spent the duration of this journey enjoying the electric massage system. In the, in the giant leather chair while benefiting from the color-adjustable mood lighting throughout the cabin and the very premium sound system. It's a very far cry from the pickups of 20 or 30 years ago. It's a pretty cool truck to have, but I can't help but think it's a somewhat challenging vehicle to take to the job site. Challenging because you'd easily forget that you were meant to be out there actually to do some work. You'd easily forget that this truck is a tool, not a toy. Hard to move from pampering mode to work mode when you step outside. In our culture, which is so concerned with lifestyle and fulfillment and having our personal needs met, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that God has saved us so that we will enjoy our lives more, so that we can feel more fulfilled, so that we can have a happy eternity. And and there's no doubt, don't misunderstand me, knowing Christ brings us joy and fulfillment beyond measure. There's no doubting that. But Paul wants us to understand an essential truth. God has saved us in order that we might work. Our salvation has a very practical purpose, a very tangible outcome. Paul puts it very simply and very clearly. God has recreated us in Christ Jesus, and He has done that in order that we might do the good works He has prepared for us. You see, our salvation is not simply a project for our own personal fulfillment and our own enjoyment. It's not about God wanting to pamper us and spoil us. We have been given what we have been given in Christ in order that we might do the good works that God has planned and has ordained for us to do. Management consultants in the room will be familiar with the Pareto Principle, more commonly known as the 80-20 rule, which states simply that for many events and in many contexts, 80% of the results come from 20% of the causes. Now, that is a very useful rule of thumb. I think it's true in lots of different contexts and areas of endeavor. And I think it ends up applying more in church life than perhaps it ought. Wherever we've been at different churches around the place, I've noticed that a relatively small group, we'll call them the 20%, appear again and again and again to serve in various ministries. This 20% might be said to do 80% of the heavy lifting. You put out a plea for help for people to serve, and the same wonderful faces appear again and again and again. Now, of course, lots of folk here, even in this room, are engaged in all kinds of costly Christian service and ministry. And many of those ministries and acts of service are almost entirely invisible to others. They're quite unseen. They're carried out in the home, with the family, raising children in a godly way. But there is a danger, nonetheless, for all of us that we will imagine that serving the Lord, contributing to the wider ministry of His church, that's the kind of optional extra in the Christian life. 
it's the thing we get to when life is settled down, when the kids go to college, when we retire, when work is less busy. And for now, serving is that special thing that the special 20% get on with. But verse 10 challenges that kind of thinking, doesn't it? It challenges that notion because it tells us plainly that you and I are saved. Each one of us are saved. We are remade in Christ Jesus in order that we may serve. We are saved to serve. Those two, salvation and Christian service, they go hand in hand, and there shouldn't be separation between them. And so for some here, I guess, the big takeaway from this morning, the thing to go home, the thing to pray about, the thing to talk about with your spouse is simply this, how should I serve? Where do I begin? What are the good works that God has prepared in advance for me to do and He has gifted me and prepared me to do? What has God saved me to do? Now, that's a very challenging line of thought if we're focused on personal fulfillment, if we're focused on lifestyle. But the insight of verse 10 is not only challenging, it is very, very wonderful too. It is wonderful because it tells us that we are a purposeful people. It's awful to feel that life is without purpose. That's a thought and a feeling often associated with the worst kinds of psychological distress. But no, that's not a a believer's line of thought, or it shouldn't be, because God has got work for us to do. He has a purpose for us. He's redeemed us in order that we might fulfill that purpose. And more than that, He has planned out the details of those good works that we might walk in them. It can sometimes be a terrible burden making decisions for the future. I don't know if you find that. What shall I study? Where shall I live? What job shall I take? Huge decisions that loom over us at key points in life, at key junctures. But how liberating is verse 10? Just think about it. God has particular and specific good works mapped out for me and for you. He's got them planned. And so as we step out into the week to come, we do so in the confidence and the expectation that God has mapped out, God has planned particular acts of service for us to do. There may be divinely appointed encounters with people whom God is just putting in our path that we might minister to them and we might serve them. There may be natural opportunities to contribute to the life of the church. There will be work to do. We sometimes speak of children who face threatening circumstances or health crises in the womb as being miracle babies. And there's something very special about a miracle baby. I remember growing up, I had a great friend at school whose parents had been in a terrible car crash when his mother was expecting him. The father was actually killed. The mother was terribly injured. But this baby survived against all the odds, and there was always this sense that this boy had something special about him, and very much so from his mother's perspective. It was a wonderful story in the midst of a a terrible tragedy. If you belong to Jesus Christ, your life story is a great miracle story. You've been rescued from the darkest situation, and you have been given an unimaginably great salvation. And your life has a special purpose in the greater plan of God. He has rescued you, and He has rescued me for a reason, that He might display His kindness in us through all eternity. And He saved us in order that we might do particular works that He has planned out, that He has foreordained for us. And knowing all this, Seeing the great sweep of God's plans and intentions, aren't we a privileged people? Do you feel that this morning? How privileged you are if you belong to Jesus Christ. Aren't we a favored people? Aren't we a blessed people? And isn't our God a very great and a very kind and a very gracious and a very glorious God? Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, our message called Brought from Death to Life, part of our series, The Unsearchable Riches of Christ. 
Well, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported program. If you're a regular listener, you know that. We depend on your generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on this station. And this is the final week to give a gift of any amount. Receive as a thank you a three-book series from Tim Keller where he writes about birth, marriage, and death. It's our thank you for your financial support this month. If you want to find out more about this or give your gift online, you can do that by coming to our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. You can also call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884. Or again, the website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Thanks for doing that and for listening today. Thanks also to our producer, Mark Breda. I'm Steve Hiller, and I hope you'll join us next time. Oh,